from the macabre minds of Laughing Devil Production comes another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind, amp up your imagination, and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. Phantoms of the Theater Copson's Traveling Theater Around the late 1860, Copson's Traveling Theater was a popular form of entertainment that visited the towns and hamlets of Minnesota, Wisconsin, and the Lake Superior side of Michigan. The name Copson was well known in the world of traveling entertainment, and this particular outfit was run by Ephraim T. Copson, Jr., whose grandfather had come to those parts from New York in 1847 with a traveling show. To celebrate the incorporation of the city of Minneapolis in 1872, civic and neighborhood parties were held, and Copson's Traveling Theater set up on a site south of the city. For two days before the theater opened to the public, Mr. Copson sent the actors around the city delivering handbills to advertise the show. Three short plays were to be enacted every performance with two vaudeville routines in between. The highlight of one of the between play spots was Herman the Hypnotist, an act put on by a German actor called Herman Eichmann. Copson's theater comprised a stage on wheels to which was fronted a huge tent for the audience who sat on rough wooden benches. Flanking the pay box were booths of coconut shies and hooplas and a stall selling sweetmeats and candy. For this celebration show, a large crowd of folk came out from Minneapolis. A full ten minutes before the curtain rose, houseful notices went up, and every bench was filled with expectant crowds, cramming peanuts and popcorn into their mouths and sucking the sticky candy. The first two plays in The Fat Lady and the Donkey in the first vaudeville routine had met with loud applause and raucous amusement. A murmur went up from the crowd as the hypnotist was due to appear. In the foul-smelling smoke of a firecracker, the hypnotist made a spectacular entrance. His tall figure, thin to the point of emaciation, his white, made-up complexion, and most of all his dark, mascara-tinted eyelids, and his large and sparkling eyes compelled immediate attention. His garments, a very severe black suit and a black string tie, added a final Faustian touch. With resignation and a kind of quiet contempt, the hypnotist surveyed the audience. Then a sonorous voice reached to the far corners of the tent. It is necessary for me to have a volunteer from among you. The accent was guttural and Germanic. If some person would kindly step up. Everyone looked around and smirked, nudging his neighbor, but no one advanced to the worn stage. The German hypnotist looked bored. I can do no act unless someone comes up here with me. He lighted a cigarette and slouched against one of the flies. A little more kindly, he said. No one will get hurt. It is quite a harmless act, totally without danger. He looked around expectantly, and presently a precocious-looking girl made her way up from the third row. The hypnotist bowed to her deliberately, sweeping the stage with his top hat, and helped her to a chair in the center of the stage. Relax, intoned the hypnotist. Soon you will be asleep, and you'll do exactly what I tell you. The girl leaned cheekily and whispered something coarse to the hypnotist, who glared at her. In a moment, the hypnotist fixed the girl with his enormous painted eyes, and the young woman tensed. Suddenly, out of the audience, someone threw a large ball of sticky taffy, which landed on the girl's head. She jerked slightly, as if awaking from a dream, and the crowd yelled with delight. The hypnotist went scarlet with rage. He faced the audience and shouted, Who did that? The audience went unnaturally quiet. At length, the hypnotist stopped trembling with rage and returned to the girl, whom he dismissed with a wave of his hand. For a moment, the hypnotist stalked around the stage with hands behind his back. 
then his face the audience once more. Perhaps the clown who threw the candy would care to assist me? Everyone in the audience now looked towards the figure of Archie Collins, who was sitting in the front row. The hypnotist caught the cue immediately and began to taunt the young man. Archie Collins was a daredevil. No real harm in him, just impudence. He sat and blushed as the audience began to shout, Archie! 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 After a minute, the young man could stand it no longer, and he raced up the rickety steps onto the stage. All eyes were now back on the platform, and folks began to murmur. Was it the footlights? The hypnotist's face looked more skeletal than ever. The hypnotist motioned for young Collins to sit in the chair, and in under 30 seconds, the lad was hypnotized and quite rigid. The hypnotist's voice droned on. You are now asleep. You will do anything I say. Remember anything. Suddenly the hypnotist's tones changed to one of stifled excitement. Now rise from the stage. Don't stand. Rise as if you were a puppet. The crowd drew a collective breath and murmured with fright as Archie Collins hung in midair like a broken marionette. Rise, rise, went on the hypnotist as the boy floated above the band and the few front rows of the audience. Ha! Huh, it's all a trick, someone shouted from the audience. Cut him down, somebody. A ripple of laughter ensued, but most stared open mouth as Collins floated nearer to the roof of the tent. Abruptly, the audience's attention left Archie as someone shouted, Look at the hypnotist guy! And on stage, the figure transformed itself into a skeletal being, which slowly levitated itself a foot or so from the stage planking and then disappeared. Thud! Thud! A sickening noise came from the roof of the tent as Archie's prone body encountered the canvas and the body flipped over to show the boy's bruised face. Then the rotten canvas gave way and Archie Collins' body disappeared into the night air. Archie Collins was never seen again. The boy's family reported him missing and the police visited Copson's traveling theater to investigate. Whoever the hypnotist was on the stage, they were assured it was not Herman the hypnotist as billed. Half an hour or so before the show started, the German had been taken ill with food poisoning and was tended throughout the stage performance by his wife and Mr. Copson's personal assistant, Al Jones. Herman Eichmann's son, Ulrich, had run to Copson's caravan and had told him of his father's sudden illness. After he had sent for the doctor, Copson had instructed the fat lady and her performing donkey to take the hypnotist's place. As she stood in the wings to go on, the fat lady had been pushed aside by a figure who resembled her Eichmann. But everybody now knew that it couldn't have been the German. Who was this strange figure who disappeared in front of the Minneapolis audience? And where did Archie Collins go? No one could offer an explanation and the police file remains open. Beatrice Lilly's Personal Poltergeist Personal poltergeists are not unusual in theatrical circles. The late Sir Noel Coward certainly had one which became a permanent tenant of his Chelsea studio in London. Although he never admitted seeing the ghost himself, several of his friends attested that they saw it. Coward always hinted that the spectral intruder inspired him to write his spook play, Blythe Spirit. When Coward sold his London home and took up residence at Spithead Lodge, Warwick Parish, Bermuda, the ghost apparently went with him. One of Noel Coward's best friends, Beatrice Lilly, the internationally celebrated comedian, also had a personal poltergeist. The psychic experience produced by his wraith were neither destructive nor unpleasant, only mischievous and embarrassing. Her poltergeist had apparently been following her around for years by the time she appeared at Palm Beach Playhouse in her show, An Evening with Beatrice Lilly. As Miss Lilly had a large dressing room, she allowed one of her troupe, Constance Carpenter, to keep one of her costumes there. Only three people had keys to the room, a maid, a dresser, and Beatrice Lilly herself. Before one particular performance, Miss Carpenter discovered that she couldn't get into their costume. The skirt had been stitched all the way across the hem with a coarse yellowish cotton thread. 
She quickly ripped out the stitches and ran onto the stage just in time to answer her cue. After that, she kept the costume in her own dressing room. No culprit was ever found. During the second part of the show, Miss Lily carried a small black fan. One evening, she told the theatrical columnist Danton Walker, when I left my dressing room for the number just before the one when I used the fan, it was lying on my dressing room table. My dresser locked the dressing room door as usual and accompanied me to the stage. When we returned, the fan was nowhere to be seen. We searched everywhere but couldn't find it, and I finally had to go on with another fan that I located in my wardrobe trunk. Two days later, the fan was back on my dressing room table, in exactly the same place we had last seen it. There was no possible way for it at that time to have been put back without someone seeing the person doing it. In another of her numbers, Miss Lily wore a Japanese wig, elaborately ornamented with a decorative twigs. One evening she found that all the decorations had been removed from the wig and were laid in an orderly fashion on the dressing room table. Again, the door to the dressing room had been locked. None of the key holders could have tampered with the wig. But the time I really became annoyed, seeth Miss Lily, was when one of my rings disappeared, again, from my dressing room table. I looked everywhere for it, everywhere that I could think of. Then, almost as if it were a compulsion from some unknown source, finally stood on a chair and looked to see what might be on a high shelf in the dressing room. And there on the shelf was the ring I had lost, that bloody poltergeist. Turner's Waxwork Theater Madame Marie Toussaint, who passed away in 1850, is probably the most famous of all exhibitors of waxworks. Born in Strasbourg, she had studied art with her uncle in Paris and was appointed drawing mistress to the ill-fated family of Louis XVI of France. Coming to England in 1802, she settled in London, where her exhibition, first shown at the Lyceum and the Strand, became one of the most popular sites in the city. During the 1857, Richard Turner, a theatrical entrepreneur, visited the show and decided that an exhibition of waxworks was just what he wanted for a semi-permanent show he desired to put on in Sacramento, then brimming with migrants who had streamed into California in the wake of James Wilson Marshall's discovery of gold at Sutter's Mill on January 24, 1848. As a nucleus for his collection, he bought from the Tussaud family a group of waxworks that had not proved popular with the London audiences. The group was that of six French actors who had gone to the guillotine during the Reign of Terror in Paris. Turner used these waxworks as the figures in a French Revolution guillotine scene, which he hoped would be gory enough to attract the hard-bitten miners. Turner's Waxworks Theater made something of a splash in Sacramento and made more than a line or two in the local newspaper. Richard Turner was delighted that he had gone ahead with his enterprise. About a week after the show opened, however, a curious thing began to happen. Each morning, when the janitor unlocked the door where the waxworks were kept, one of their number was never in the same position, and its wax head was always on the floor behind the figure. This went on for some weeks, although the room was securely locked and its exterior patrolled. The figure had always assumed any position, and the head was removed by the next morning. Richard Turner and the janitor even spent a night in the room. They both fell asleep and woke up in the morning to find that the occurrence had taken place while they slept. They tried again, and this time they were more successful. Richard Turner left this record of what they saw. It was remarkable. A little before 2.30 in the morning, the figure of Monsieur Nicodeme Leopold Lapide began to move. First the arms, and then the legs stirred. After a moment, we saw the wax face take on a more flesh and blood image, and the brown frown as if in anger, and then we heard a voice. The waxwork theater owner could not speak French, but he memorized what the voice had said. Later, Richard Turner repeated what he and the janitors had heard to a French-Canadian working in Sacramento. Is it not possible to get some peace at night, said the voice. The people came to see us die, now they come to see our spirits encased in wax. Come here no more during the hours of darkness, or you will regret it. 
Somehow a journalist from a Sacramento newspaper heard of the strange encounter and asked if he could be allowed to stay in the room with the waxworks overnight to see for himself. Reluctantly, Richard Turner agreed, and the young man was locked in the room. The janitor, however, remained outside the door all night. At exactly 2.31, the janitor was aroused by screams and hammerings coming from the room. He quickly unlocked the door, and the hysterical figure of the journalist slumped into his arms in a faint. For his editor, the journalist wrote up his account of what he had seen. The room where the waxworks are kept is square in shape with a vaulted roof. It is dimly lit with lamps on brackets all around the room. It was, by Mr. Turner's instructions, an eerie and uncomfortable chamber, inviting all who entered to talk in reverent whispers. The waxworks of the executed French men and women stand on individual podes with neatly printed labels at their feet. There were five of them in all, two aristocrats, a man and a woman, and their faded silks and lace all taken from their bodies at death. A curé making a shop window gesture with his Bible to a young lady in waiting, and a bland looking man in a black suit and a frilled white shabbat. I read the names. The man in the black suit was Nicodeme Leopold Lapide, about whom all the fuss was made. I knew nothing about him then, but have discovered since that he was a tax gatherer for a French duke and had won the hatred of my lord's tenants by lining his pockets with their hard earned sous. As I sat in the gloom of the lamps, the dim, wavering light fell on the rows of figures which were so uncannily like human beings that the silence and stillness of their forms made them seem even more unnatural and ghastly. I greatly missed the sound of breathing, the rustle of clothes, and the perpetual sequence of noises one hears even when a deep silence has fallen over a vast crowd. For an hour or two, I sat facing the sinister figures boldly enough. They were, after all, only waxworks. Mr. Turner and old Ezra Potter, the janitor, must have been mistaken. This pile of smelly old wax couldn't move except with miner's blasting powder. This I kept telling myself. Among the figures standing in their stiff, unnatural poses, that of Monsieur Leopold Lepide, the effigy of the dreadful little taxman, did stand out with a queer prominence perhaps because it was the lamp directly behind him. Waxworks don't move, but every time I looked away from the tax man, when I looked back again, he seemed to have struck a slightly different pose. I kept on looking, and this time I saw something. The waxworks arm did move, slowly at first, then more rapidly a sudden flick of its head. I stared, rather petrified, gripping the chair in which I sat. To my added horror, where the waxwork head had been a ghostly visage now formed, with a cruel, rapacious leer. It turned towards me and moved off its podium. I jumped up to face it, and the waxwork ghost made towards me. What frightened me the most was the way I could see through its head. Back into the door, I tapped on it to get the janitor to see the phenomena. There was no answer. I banked hard this time as the waxwork ghost moved closer. I turned and started to bang my fist on the door. I screamed, too, as I felt the horrid wax hands close around my neck. I screamed again and can't remember any more, only the welcoming face of Ezra Potter. I would swear by all that is holy that this that I have written is true. Next morning, the head of the waxworks of Monsieur Leopold Lapide was found on the floor next to the other figures. Strangely, the body was over by the door in a heap yet the fingers of the waxworks were flat and displaced, as if the wax had been softened and gone out of shape. Could this have been done when they pressed against the journalist's neck? The waxwork was melted down and replaced by another figure in the scene, and thereafter there were no further strange movements. The Turner Waxwork Theatre was to operate until 1885 when it was supplanted by Life Theatre in Sacramento. The journalist's story never appeared in print in the local press, and for some reason the editor decided to spike the story. The tale only came to light in the 1930s on the death of the journalist. Metropolitan Opera House Ghost James Reynolds, artist and designer who won fame for his sets of the Greenwich Village Follies, 
always averred that the Metropolitan Opera House, New York, which was first built on 39th Street in 1883, was haunted. Reynolds often recounted the story of a woman friend who attended a matinee alone about 1955. Apparently, the woman had not intended going to the opera alone, but at the last minute, the friend she was to go with canceled the date. So the woman sold the extra ticket back to the Met box office. As she settled herself in the seat, Reynolds' friend became more and more annoyed by the person who had turned up to occupy the seat where her friend was to have sat. Her neighbor was now a thick-set, busty woman, dressed in a silk suit that rustled every time she moved. The woman who crackled the program noisily on purpose, it seemed, and whenever the leading soprano in the opera sang an aria, she would nudge Reynolds' friend on the arm and hiss, Flat, flat, flat! Shushing this woman seemed of no use, so the friend of James Reynolds went to complain to the manager. One of the ushers went down the aisle to investigate, but on his return reported to the manager that the seat in question was empty and had been so since the beginning of the performance, according to the people around. Once again the ghost of Madame Frances Alda had appeared, it seemed, as she had several times before, as the wife of director Giulio Gatti Casaza, she had been well known for her loud comments on the performances of her rivals. Time and again in life she had sat in the stalls and made rude remarks about the acting and singing of the artist, her favorite comment being flat, flat, flat. Even in death she returned to deride. Strange report, when Reynolds' friend got home she found that her arm was black and blue from the nudging. Did Chinese Spirits Reclaim a Theater? Under the dateline Vancouver, December 13, 1947, Ted Greenslade made this report to the paper Saturday night. Oxen plowed through the mud on Granville Street. The Klondike Gold Rush was yet to be heard of, and cutting off the pigtails of Chinese was a popular sport with young bloods when the Sing Q Society took over a building on Corral Street and made it into Vancouver's first Chinese theater. Last week this landmark burned, and in the flames died, not only for Chinese, but the ghost of a lot of the yesterdays of men who played a part in the pioneering of Canada. Of late years, the building had been partitioned off to make sleeping cubicles and workshops, and there are those among the Chinese who believe some ghostly prompting may have started the fire. To the ancient Chinese, society goes down the scale from the artist and teacher to the artisan, to the farmer, and then to the soldier. Perhaps, claim the ancients, the spirits who haunt the theater know that the ancient drama is dying. They have seen the house lose face. Old Chinese know it is preferable that one dies. The fire will make the spirits of the past truly dead. The Spook Who Promoted a Play Ghosts are not always helpful to actors and actresses. Kim Novak, for instance, when she was filming Mole Flanders, was terrified by the venerable ghost of the Lady in White, who has shared the Norman Castle homo successes Viscounts Masserine and Ferrard at Chelham, Kent, England, since the Middle Ages. Miss Novak is probably the first American post-war victim of the ghostly lady, who has the disconcerting habit of wafting herself at midnight through the ancient slabs of the dungeons at Chelham Castle. Kim Novak caught sight of the ghost on the dungeon stairs, and got such a fright that she fell down the steps and was injured. This haunting stems from the time when an unknown lady was bricked up in one of the walls by the order of Lord Bartholomew de Battlesmere, who was later beheaded for treason by King Edward I. Empresario Guthrie McClintock, however, had nothing but good to say about ghosts. His particular phantom advised him to support the play The Barretts of Wimpole Street after it had been turned down by some 28 producers. McClintock described a psychic story in his memoirs. Another great theater man, David Belasco, saw a ghost and wrote a play. David Belasco, who died in 1931, was to become one of America's most famous dramatists. Born in San Francisco, the son of Humphrey Abraham Belasco, an English Jew, David Belasco first appeared at the Metropolitan Theater at San Francisco and went on to be stage manager of the Madison Square Theater in New York. He is best remembered for his plays, Hearts of Oak, La Belle Russe, May Blossom, 
Valerie, and the Girl of the Golden West. He was later owner and manager of the Belasco Theater in New York. In the 1920s, the psychic researcher Ida Clyde Clark made a study of a curious ghost story concerning Belasco, of which this is her full report. On a snowy November evening in 1903, David Belasco arrived at his Newport home exhausted in mind and body. He was in the midst of rehearsing Zara, a play whose ownership was in dispute. In his comfortable library, with his adored young daughter Augusta sitting on the arm of the chair, he relaxed and his mood grew soft and reminiscent. The night before, Augusta had seen a rehearsal of Zara, and he asked her opinion of it, for he always said she was his best critic. Augusta didn't like to play, and she told him so. Father, she said, I wish you'd do a story of the supernatural sometime. It is a subject in which everybody is interested. Her father smiled at her and shook his head. Not after the river of souls in the darling of the gods, he said, reminding her of the trouble he had had with special effects in a previous production. They laughed together, but as he kissed her good night, she turned serious once more. Promise me you will do a play dealing with the supernatural. You write the play and I will produce it, he answered. Feeling rested and relaxed, he soon fell into a deep sleep. Shortly after midnight, he awoke with a start. Feeling a presence in the room, he looked up and saw his mother standing beside his bed, gazing down upon him. He knew that she was in San Francisco, yet there she was standing close to him. He made an effort to speak, to rise, but he could not move nor utter a sound. Then his mother, whom he had always loved tenderly, smiled and said, Davy, Davy, Davy. There was an infinite tenderness in her eyes, and she leaned down and kissed him. Do not grieve for me. All is well, and I am happy. Then she moved towards the door and vanished. Almost immediately, he again fell into a restful sleep. Next morning, he told his experience at the breakfast table. But the family laughed and told him it was only a dream. Your mother is well and in San Francisco, his wife said. Had she been ill, we would have heard. As he kissed Augusta goodbye that morning, he whispered, I know that my dear mother is dead, Augusta. I know it. When he reached his office, he found a telegram stating that his mother had died at the precise hour he had seen her standing beside his bed. Later he learned that just before she died, she spoke of him and called his name. Davy, Davy, Davy. That night Augusta went to her father's room to try once more to say something that would comfort him. As she sat beside him, he took her hand and said, My little guardian, now we will write a great play. It will deal with the actual return of the dead, for the dead do return. My mother has convinced me by coming back to me at the moment of her death. The experience resulted and one of Belasco's most famous plays, The Return of Peter Grimm. When the play was first produced in Boston, October 18th of 1911, the printed program contained a statement from David Belasco to the effect that he had been inspired to write and produce the play by his mother's appearance to him at the time of her death. Many believe that Belasco haunts his own theater. In life, the playwright had been something of a poseur. He decorated his living quarters like a monastery and wore a monk's habit. Actors from time to time, it seems, have seen him sitting in his favorite stage box, a dim shade behind the plush curtains, his features clearly visible, and his monk's cowl pushed down. Folks say, too, that the elevator at the Belasco Theater can be heard whirring up and down of its own accord after 11 o'clock at night. Velasco's ghost on its way to the actors' former rooms at the top of the theater, perhaps. At night, too, when the theater is empty and in darkness, laughter can be heard, footsteps and singing, and doors opening and shutting with a bang. But most unnerving of all, the front curtain mysteriously raises, hovers, and lowers itself. <laughs>